Okay, I see people piling in now. I'll give it a couple more seconds here. Okay, well, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Jamie Bartek, and I'm the Programs Manager for the Kentucky Military History Museum at the Kentucky Historical Society. And I'd like to welcome you to the Kentucky Military History Museum Speaker Series, which focuses broadly on various aspects of military history, but with a particular emphasis on topics that relate to the Civil War, uh, Kentucky history, Appalachian history, and Southern history. Many of the presentations will be virtual and will remain free to the, to the public, um, while others will be a hybrid format held in person at the History Center in Frankfurt, but also able to be viewed live via the KHS Facebook or YouTube channel. Uh, tonight's presenter is Dr. David Swartz. Uh, he teaches history at Asbury University and is the author of several books on American religious history. He is currently working on two research projects, one on the American anti-trafficking movement in Thailand and Cambodia, and the other a study of Civil War memory in Jesmin County, Kentucky. The title of that work, How the One Cause Lost the Bluegrass, Camp Nelson, a Confederate statue in Civil War memory, is the subject of tonight's talk. Uh, this presentation will be recorded, and at some point it will be available to view on our YouTube channel. The Q&A function has been enabled, so if you do have questions, just type them in as we go, and we'll try to address them as best we can after the presentation. And with that, I will turn it over to David. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, I appreciate this invitation by uh, the Kentucky Historical Society and Military History Museum to speak tonight. And I want to begin uh, simply by saying, as Jamie already pointed out, that the Civil War is a new field uh, for me. I'm a scholar of modern American religion, and I also grew up Amish Mennonite in a culture, obviously, uh, that did not focus much on war. And so the, the Civil War felt quite distant to me while I was growing up. But when I moved from Northern Indiana uh, to Jessamine County, Kentucky about 10 years ago, I became absolutely uh, fascinated by Civil War memory. And that's because it felt kind of like there were ghosts and apparitions all around me all the time. There are old slave cabins across the street from the middle school that my kids go to school at. Uh, a friend of mine found graves of enslaved people on her property down by the Kentucky River. And then she started seeing objects levitate in her home. She was convinced that ghosts upset about antebellum violence um, were controlling these objects. As the title of my presentation suggests, there's also a Confederate statue on our courthouse lawn. It was dedicated in 1896 by Bennett Young, the infamous St. Albans Raider and John Hunt Morgan disciple who had invaded the North from the North, that is Vermont from Canada. And I quickly learned that Young had grown up just miles from my new home. And then I visited Camp Nelson, a Union Supply Depot and a Emancipation Center it was a site that was also shrouded in distant memory until it emerged from the mists of the Kentucky River in the 1990s, and then, of course, named a national monument in 2017. So it really did feel like the Civil War was everywhere, and I could hear echoes in so many contemporary events, especially the Black Lives Matter protests that took place beside that Confederate statue in June of 2020. I'm going to pause a moment here uh, to start my visual presentation. Is that working, Jamie? Good. So most research on Civil War memory uh, focuses on the triumph of Confederate memory. But tonight I want to focus on the failure of Union memory, which I would suggest uh, was not inevitable. In fact, the numbers of soldiers on each side was roughly the same in Jessamine County. Uh, 
And because of Camp Nelson, the Union had a much stronger uh, footprint on the land itself. Here's a picture of Camp Nelson, I think from 1864. It was a huge operation. If it had been a real city, it would have been the third largest in the Commonwealth at the time. And one last reason it wasn't inevitable, of course, is that the Union won the war. So the question is, how did the one cause lose the bluegrass? Now, before I try to answer that question, I want to put a map up to help us all get our bearings uh, just a little bit. So Jessamine County, of course, is located in the bluegrass region of Kentucky, just south of Lexington. You can see uh, Fayette County there uh, bounding Jessamine County to the north. To the south, it's bounded by the Kentucky River, which isn't labeled, but it's that windy line there on the bottom. Um, and the three or four places within the county that I want to emphasize here uh, is Nicholasville, uh, which is the county seat right there in the middle at the intersection of those uh, railroad tracks. Uh, Wilmore is just a few miles to the west. That's where I live and where I teach history at Asbury University. Uh, Keene is uh, to the north of Wilmore. I'll mention that a couple of times. And then the last place is Camp Nelson there um, at the bottom, uh, right on the Kentucky River. Now, Confederate identity did not predominate initially. Indeed, it seemed hopelessly fractured. Confederate veterans spent quite a bit of energy fighting each other after the war ended. A lot of the recrimination centered on how the war had been conducted and lost. Critics, especially soldiers in the regular Confederate regiments, criticized John Hunt Morgan's raiders as being foolhardy and undisciplined. After all, they had shot up a town of civilians and robbed three banks. So to admit to having served under Morgan for some Confederate veterans was tantamount to a confession of murder and highway robbery. In Jessamine County, the debate turned deadly even after the war. In October of 1867, not long after a soldier named Lewis Price had returned home from his exile as a St. Albans Raider, the young man confronted a fellow citizen named James Mitchell on the streets of Nicholasville. And you can see the line pointing to Lewis Price there and he's among his fellow uh, raiders of St. Albans. Bryce accused Mitchell, a rebel veteran himself, of, quote, making some remarks relative to Price's connection with the St. Albans raid, and he demanded a retraction. When Mitchell refused to apologize, a scuffle ensued. After Price pinned Mitchell to the ground, drew his knife, and threatened to kill him, Mitchell denied having made the remarks and begged to be released. They separated temporarily, but passions had not yet cooled by the next morning when they again encountered each other, this time outside Mitchell's shop. Mitchell approached Price with a pistol, ordered the ex raider to halt, and fired. Shot in the chest, Price died 10 minutes later, leaving behind his widowed mother and his fiancée whom he was to have married in just weeks. Who needed enemies with comrades like this? In contrast, Union memory surged, especially at the enormous Camp Nelson. It began during the war itself with the building of a rudimentary graveyard next to the hospital. By July of 1865, 379 graves had been filled with victims of smallpox, battlefield wounds, and accidents. The one-acre yard contained an undetermined number of white soldiers at one end, black soldiers at the other, and black women and children refugees in between them. Here's an image of some of the Camp Nelson uh, refugees. Over the next year, while Camp Nelson was deconstructed, the army collected bodies from three other sites around the camp. It installed new headboards and named it a national cemetery. 
it was the first physical preservation of Union memory in Jessamine County. But the morbid work had only just begun. There were still thousands of bodies scattered in the bluegrass countryside at risk of being plowed up in the spring. Or worse, said one Union general, desecrated by the, quote, savage and vindictive spirit on the part of the disloyal inhabitants. Assigned to locate such graves across the Western theater, quartermaster Edmund Whitman published a circular entitled Important Information Wanted in 300 Newspapers. It asked for help in finding bodies. The rigorous and systematic work that followed, which was sometimes resisted by hostile Southern whites, was helped by black inhabitants and former colored troops who spent months riding horses through the countryside, hunting for temporary graves and marking the spots. In the end, Whitman recovered 2,023 bodies from makeshift graves in Frankfurt, Richmond, Perryville, London, and Covington. In the summer of 1868, large disinterring parties got to work. If the original coffin had partially decayed, as most, as most had, a flat spade was insert, inserted under the head and shoulders of the body. Another spade was laid on the top and clamped as tightly as possible as the body was drawn out. As reports said, workers carefully placed every particle into the new coffin. Any personal effects, such as watches, knives, greenbacks, and identification were sent to the Camp Nelson Cemetery superintendent to be forwarded to relatives. One funeral procession, which took the dead from Perryville to Camp Nelson, consisted of a long train of army wagons, each stacked with 15 or 20 coffins. The work, which didn't finish until six years after the war, seemed endless. It was also expensive, costing an average of $9.75 for each of the 303,536 bodies recovered across the nation. And it was stark work. Quartermaster Whitman described it as, quote, a harvest of death. These grim scenes, however, turned beautiful in the decades to follow. The federal government, seeking to create meaning from death, transformed wartime wastelands into 20 national cemeteries. Visitors turning east into the Camp Nelson Cemetery from the hot white limestone Lexington Danville Pike entered a driveway shaded by a double row of poplar trees. After a distance of an eighth of a mile, they passed by an archive and a funeral parlor all housed in a substantial two-story stone and brick lodge, also used as a residence for the cemetery's superintendent. Moving through an elegant gate and limestone fence, visitors then traversed bucolic paths that curved through the yard. As the cemetery grew to 12 acres in the, 18, nine, in the 1890s, the grounds were ornamented with shrubs, flower beds, 726 trees of 27 varieties, monuments with poetic inscriptions, and bluegrass that was said to look like a green velvet carpet. The view is transcendent, too, said one visitor. On a beautiful knoll, whence you can see 40 miles in a stretch, God's fairest acres lie the bones of thousands of the nation's heroes awaiting the final trumpet to call to the last muster. To be sure, the endless rows of graves, over 1,000 of which had, still had no names, still marked the incomprehensible cost of war. But those graves, previously marked by rapidly decaying wooden headboards, now featured gleaming white marble stones with only the ver barely visible foundation stones of large storehouses, hinting that this had been the site of a mammoth military industrial complex. Camp Nelson was now a place of elegant beauty. <laughs>
Indeed, this repository of death became a destination. Friday afternoon, read one account of a local excursion, was delightfully spent in riding and driving, the whole party making a trip to the Camp Nelson National Cemetery, where the soldiers of so many states sleep the sleep that knows no waking, end of quote. In the late 1890s, out-of-state tourists began to arrive on the Queen and Crescent Railroad or in automobiles following motor drive guides. Others visited the cemetery on steamer tours of the Kentucky River that included a balloon ascension, a parachute leap, barge dances, spectacular views of the Palisades, and visits to Daniel Boone's cave. Veterans also came to honor the graves of fallen comrades to reminisce about their participation in the war and to research in the archive. The results were often published in articles that filled Northern newspapers at the turn of the century. Given the over 100,000 soldiers who passed through the Army Depot during the war and the thousands of soldiers from 117 regiments and 16 states who lay in the cemetery, Camp Nelson had a vast reach. In, in Union memory. Context illuminates Camp Nelson's significance. While the cemetery may have been necessary and humane, it also embodied a tendentious argument that the Union had won and consequently should triumph in the nation's memory. Planted in ground surrounded by Confederate sympathizing farms, was a flagstaff 100 feet high from which a 24 by 48 foot United States flag flew from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. every day. Immense cannon that had been captured from the Confederates sat on granite bases. Said one visitor, the government's strict surveillance of its heroes' resting places is very manifest here. Even the architectural style reinforced concepts of victory and national glory. The rostrum and the six-room superintendent's house were designed by the distinguished Montgomery Meigs to follow Second Empire architecture. Commissioned by the War Department, these cemeteries and the massive just-constructed state war and navy building in Washington, D.C., meant to extend a federal agenda and to project the image of a powerful nation state that might compete with European countries. According to one historian, the design would have been experienced by locals as a quote, permanent systematic embodiment of federal authority within the former Confederacy. The fences, flags, and Yankee accents at Camp Nelson seem to suggest that Union occupation had never ended. The cemetery also imposed standardization. To be sure, the immensity of the, the body's problem demanded bureaucratic efficiency. It made sense for the government to take bids on 100,000 identical grave markers and to group them by state and lay them out with mathematical precision. It also made sense to build exact replicas of Camp Nelson Cemetery Lodge at national cemeteries in Nashville Murfreesboro, Corinth, and Pittsburgh Landing. Professionalized superintendents, skilled in hospitality and groundskeeping, oversaw the maintenance of these facilities. Quartermaster generals who circulated through a vast national cemetery system that was 81 cemeteries large by the 1890s inspected everything for uniformity and order. Again, all of this, the search for bodies, the labor of digging them up, the investment in transportation, the reburials, the construction of buildings and stone fences took place on a grand scale at grand expense. The money came from the same seemingly unlimited treasury that had funded the war machine in the first place. Camp Nelson superintendent reinforced the union's early hegemony over war memory. Stephen S. Cole, a famed raconteur who ran the cemetery for 37 years, boasted that a federal soldier he had captured the local newspaper after Vicksburg fell 
and published a special issue of that newspaper in which he mocked the Confederate diet of mule meat and kitten stew during the siege. He told cemetery visitors that he had been a personal friend of General Ulysses S. Grant and even President Lincoln, who he had gotten to know while in the Secret Service at the White House during the war. He told newspapers that Lincoln himself had appointed him superintendent just before the president was assassinated and that he had voted for every Republican candidate since. Into the 20th century, wrote one newspaper reporter, the Civil War is just as fresh in the old man's mind as though it was only yesterday. He speaks vehemently of those rebels as he limps proudly along under the giant elms in the cemetery where 3,668 Union soldiers are buried, end of quote. When a visitor asked which side was buried at Camp Nelson, Cole snorted and said, Yankee, I told them that we dug up and moved all the secessioners to Nicholasville some years ago so our boys could sleep more peacefully. In part because of Cole, Camp Nelson reminded locals, both Confederates and Unionists, what they had hated about the federal prosecution of the war, standardization, bureaucratization, management from afar, economic power, self-righteousness, and how it all resulted in unfathomable, unfathomable levels of death. Every last Monday in May, Camp Nelson put Union memory on conspicuous display. On the federally designated holiday of Memorial Day, Jessamine County shut down the post office and all banks. Camp Nelson's giant flag perched on a hill and visible for many miles on the turnpike beckoned citizens to honor fallen Union soldiers. The ritual began with members of the Grand Army of the Republic, an enormous organization of Union veterans, forming a line and firing volleys from 150 muskets. The former soldiers then led crowds as large as 5,000 in, in the spreading of flowers, garlands, and U.S. insignias on the graves. After breaking for basket lunches under the shade trees, the formal program began. From the rostrum, an octagonal platform made of a brick and iron super superstructure, bands play patriotic tunes and guest speakers offered stirring and eloquent addresses. They lauded dead heroes who gave up their lives to preserve the Union. Those who, quote, died that the Republic might live. And, quote, the noble dead who fought so manfully to save the country they so dearly loved. According to an attendee in 1876, the speeches and rituals comprised quite an imposing affair. By the end of the afternoon, the cemetery's marble stones and manicured lawns glistened with honor. Notably, Memorial Day in Jessamine did not celebrate only Union of North and South. The all-black post number 142 of the GAR interpreted the war through the lens of emancipation. Napoleon Price, the post's commander, had been a slave for his first 37 years and was sold at least once as a 15-year-old on Nicholasville's slave auction block until he was emancipated from his owner, Harvey Huggins, after enlisting at Camp Nelson. The war was truly emancipatory for Price. Within five years, he accumulated $800 worth of real estate in his work as a carpenter. He became a voter, a councilman in Nicholasville, and most significantly, he said, a free, loyal American citizen. In his role as a post commander, he issued Memorial Day invitations to all regardless of race or color. As the master of ceremonies, Price cut a striking figure, wearing a double-breasted dark blue coat with bronze buttons and a black wide-brimmed slouch hat with a gold wreath insignia. He read the Gettysburg Address and presided over the racially integrated crowd as they celebrated and picnicked together in an integrated cemetery. Though separated by regiment, 867 black bodies tucked between the limestone and the gravestones 
lay within feet of the approximately 1,500 white graves. More significantly, the marble headboards of white and black soldiers who would have been emancipated had they survived the war were identical. This signified a kind of democratization of the dead. Even the planning and execution of Memorial Day festivities was racially integrated. Commander Price and Superintendent Cole worked together at fundraising and recruiting white politicians, black orators, and musical acts such as the Camp Nelson Colored Band, the Nicholasville Drum, Colored Drum and Fife Corps, and the Keene Brass Band. Through the 19th century, Memorial Day helped retain the emancipatory character of Camp Nelson. Indeed, emancipation had brought substantial freedoms to Jessamine's former slaves. Price and thousands of others enjoyed a degree of mobility in the decades after the war. While sharecroppers lived throughout rural stretches of the county, African Americans began to congregate in three epicenters, Camp Nelson, which remained the home for hundreds of formerly enslaved refugees, the small um, village of Keene, where sharecroppers flocked each Saturday to shop and socialize, and third, a neighborhood in Nicholasville called Herveytown. Herveytown would have been uh, just to the east of Main Street there in Nicholasville, so to the, to the right. Established in 1870, this neighborhood provided low-cost housing for formerly enslaved people, including former soldiers and families of Camp Nelson. In each of these place, places, Jessamine's Black population enjoyed some measure of upward mobility and high levels of spatial solidarity. There were colored revivals, colored picnics, colored train excursions, colored fairs, colored teas, colored oratorical contests, colored Christmas festivals, colored baseball teams, colored glee clubs, colored cornet bands, and colored fraternity orders. Many of these groups and traditions took an emancipatory hue, like anniversary celebrations of the Emancipation Proclamation and national independence. Compared to black 4th of July celebrations, Independence Day among the white population, it was said, was a, quote, dull day. <laughs> Jessamine's African-Americans seemed to offer a more hopeful answer to Frederick Douglass's antebellum lament, what to the slave is the 4th of July? They were seizing the rights promised by the Declaration of Independence. Politically, Jessamine's African-Americans overwhelmingly backed the Republican Party once they secured the right to vote in 1870. In 1886, they were permitted to join Camp Nelson's Knights of Labor chapter, which consisted of 100 coopers and distillers at the E.J. Curley Distillery. In 1888, when William Henry Harrison won the presidential race, colored Republicans celebrated in the streets with a bra brass band and skyrockets, Black political activity surged in the 1890s through the powerful lobbying arm of the GAR, veterans of post number 142, helped to successfully lobby for federal pensions. They also allied with white Republicans like Nicholasville lawyer William Brown, who delivered a partisan speech at Camp Nelson that, quote, made the very hills tremble with his attacks on the Democratic Party, end of quote. What made it obscene, said the white supremacist Jessamine Journal, was that it, quote, belched up sentiments around the war question and told the darkies how the lads in gray fought to put them in slavery. The speech, it continued, tore the scalp from the Democratic Party and hurled it in the face of the colored citizens, making them believe their lives were in danger under the present political management in Jessamine. Voters in Herveytown rewarded Brown and their own black politicians, like Andrew McAfee, pictured in front of you, sweeping them to victory in Nicholasville's Ward 4 elections. Significantly, they commonly invoked the, the memory of Camp Nelson, 
most of the prominent black families of Jessamine, the Prices, the Tulls, the Spillmans, the Lyonses, the Broadduses, and the McAfees were veterans of the camp. But it also took less political form as black teachers told their pupils about the emancipationist heritage of their county, as fathers showed sons their army uniforms, as churches sang Negro spirituals. The Union graves at Camp Nelson then were not just the final resting place of bones. They signified the promise of freedom. In the 1890s, Jessamine County's message of emancipation took musical form. A singing group of a dozen black girls and boys from Camp Nelson drew praise for its performance at the 1897 Memorial Day ceremonies at Camp Nelson. Observers said that the, quote, music rendered by this party was so melodious, the songs being so quaint, and the fervor of the singers seemingly so devout that they attracted a great deal of attention and were universally pronounced the most interesting feature of the day's program. Dubbed the Camp Nelson Jubilee Singers, an allusion to the biblical instruction to release slaves, their fame spread, and under the auspices of the Salvation Army, they began touring the North. These country Negroes, as reporters called them, performed, I'm rolling through an unfriendly world in front of President William McKinley at Carnegie Hall. Though it was canceled because of the Spanish-American War, they even planned a tour of Europe. Making the emancipatory discourse all the more profound was that the last name of one of the singers, Luena Tevis, was the same as a Jessamine Raider of St. Albans. <laughs> it suggested that racial progress had been made since Luena's grandmother was owned by Squire Tevis. Perhaps a discourse of freedom really could win the post-war battle for war memory and reality. But you know where this is going. There were profound limits to the reality of freedom. Indeed, freedom stalled. The Jubilee Singers became kind of famous, but they were never remunerated for their service to the Salvation Army. Napoleon Price may have incorporated a bank, flourished in his church work, and championed Memorial Day commemorations, but none of these things saved his son Willie, a slender 16-year-old shot in the back by two drunken white men in 1888. Six years later, on the very same newspaper page that profiled Price as a, quote, encouragement of worldly advancement, there was an advertisement for Hotel Nicholas that limited service to white people only. Black children attended a segregated, underfunded school in a county that never fully implemented or enforced school equalization. And here's a, a map of the neighborhood of Hervey Town, um, at least part of it. You can see the Methodist Episcopal Church there at the top, which would have been a white church. And then the uh, East Street there, you can see the, the Christian church and the colored Baptist church as, as, uh, as being in the black neighborhood of, of Hervey Town. Moreover, Hervey Town was located in a swampy area that black residents complained made their children sick. Robert Fletcher, a son of a Camp Nelson soldier and former slave, suffered the indignity of a census taker in 1900, recording that the 36-year-old school principal living on Washington Street could write but couldn't read, <laughs> next to his vocational designation as a teacher. He could read, of course, but a lot of his neighbors in Herbie Town could not. In 1890, according to one estimate, fully 56% of the state's uh, 197,000 black citizens were illiterate. In Jessamine County, 28.2% remained illiterate until 1930. Despite emancipation, most remained in an underclass, mired in sharecropping and domestic service. Moreover, Jim Crow began to grow. Anticipating a vote on legislation that would impose racial segregation on railroads, Jessamine's black leaders met at the AME church 
in Nicholasville on a Monday evening in 1892 to oppose the so-called Jim Crow Car Bill. They elected a committee of preachers, teachers, and entrepreneurs to write a resolution describing the bill as a, quote, step backward and a stain upon the Commonwealth of Kentucky. The legislation they wrote is not in harmony with the spirit of the age, and it institutes and fosters a system of caste. Several weeks later, Robert Fletcher personally delivered the resolution to the Railroad Committee in Frankfurt. In late May, he went much further. One week before Homer Plessy illegally boarded a train in New Orleans, Fletcher stepped onto the platform of local passenger train number four of the Cincinnati Southern Railroad, scheduled to leave Nicholasville at 6.53 a.m. As he helped a woman with her luggage into the lady's car, the brakeman blocked his way. Fletcher became very much incensed and informed the brakeman that he would go into any coach he chose. At the next stop, his act of protest complete, Fletcher got off and returned to town. That did not mollify the Jessamine Journal, which noted that the school teacher has heretofore conducted himself in a very polite and genteel manner and was generally respected by all who knew him. But now, the newspaper sneered, he had become, quote, one of the principal agitators here among his race and had created quite a scene in attempting to assert what he conceived to be his rights as a free American citizen. And you might notice that the name there is not uh, Richard or Robert Fletcher, it's Philip Fletcher. That's his father. And these are his uh, papers, I think, upon enlistment at Camp Nelson. Over time, the collective union memory in Jessamine County became less about union and more about emancipation and blackness. Things like exuberant church services in Herbytown, Memorial Day festivities, and 15 cent Uncle Tom Cabin shows on a showboat at Camp Nelson. It also took the form of imperious federal symbols, two cent Lincoln memorial stamps. Financial investment viewed by locals as being very exorbitant in the National Cemetery and the closing of businesses on Memorial Day. In at least one election, the Republican Party appeared on the ballot with a picture of Abraham Lincoln. With notable exceptions, most Jessamine County whites experienced these public memories of the Civil War as insufferable self-righteousness. Again, to be reminded, reminded of immense federal wealth and power and victory and to associate those things with former slaves was simply beyond the pale. Union memory became black memory, ghettoizing in the late 19th century as Jessamine County descended into a toxic stew of racism and rage at federal authority. Most whites, even Union veterans, shunned it. John C. Welch embodied this trajectory in both life and death. He was the grandson of an Irish immigrant, the son of a Revolutionary War soldier, and owner of three slaves before the war. This, after a four-year stint in the Union Army, as the 20th Kentucky Infantry's surgeon. He attended wounded soldiers at the Battle of Perryville, the Siege of Atlanta, and Sherman's March to the Sea. After the war, Welch won multiple elections as a Democrat in the Kentucky legislature, enjoyed a 42-year medical practice, and was known for his generosity to the poor and rich alike. But significantly, he was absent from Memorial Day celebrations after the war. As a pro-slavery unionist, he had fought for national union, not emancipation. When he won his second election by 125 votes over a Republican candidate in 1877, a neighboring newspaper crowed, Jessamine County is redeemed. And when he died in 1887, he was conspicuously not buried at the Camp Nelson National Cemetery. Instead, he was buried at the all-white Maple Grove Cemetery in Nicholasville, where dozens of Confederates were conspicuously buried. One year later, a former enemy and Confederate regulator named Samuel Duncan reported approvingly that, quote, 
the true and generous minded people of Jessamine County have resolved to erect to the memory of Dr. Welch, a monument of suitable character bearing appropriate inscriptions. 23 years after the war, this unionist preferred to rest with his white enemies instead of his black comrades. Welch represented a broader white flight. African-Americans poignantly extended hospitality to whites. In 1893, Napoleon Price invited all friends and citizens to Memorial Day at Camp Nelson. In 1896, he invited all loyal citizens, both white and colored, but fewer and fewer whites showed up. No white unionists in Jessamine joined the local post of the GAR because it was black. Instead, they ignored Civil War history or joined the all-white post in Lexington, which did not emphasize emancipation as a war aim. So the equation of union memory with emancipation and blackness helps explain its decline. Just about done, but I need to address the Confederate statue. I wish I had more time to narrate the rise of the lost cause alongside this decline of union memory, but it's significant that the lost cause was not the baseline of war memory in Jessamine County. It would have to be carefully constructed over decades, both metaphorically and literally. Jessamine's Confederate statue is, for example, is so absolutely perfect. <laughs> for my purposes, not a perfect reflection of the Civil War, because of its own process of construction. The original estimate to purchase and install a seven foot high bronze statue, one made in Italy and installed by the top monument company in Lexington was $4,000. This was a monumental sum back then. Now it would be about $112,000. And it was way too much for the small county to handle especially after the economic panic of 1893. So the Jessamine Confederate Memorial Association, aided by the United Daughters of the Confederacy, postponed its construction. But other factors were working in its favor. Costs, for example, had declined through the 1880s and 1890s. American monument companies had begun packaging the services of quarries, metal foundries, sculptors, haulers, and installers. By the late 19th century, more than 2,000 standing soldiers had been built in factories and sold from monument catalogs. Jessamine County capitalized on this oversupply. G.H. Mitchell, who ran a Chicago firm, had miscalculated demand and manufactured too many Union statues. When another small town did not claim its commissioned statue, Jessamine County jumped at the leftover monument purchasing it for only $1,000, a fraction of its value. With additional costs for the foundation and installation, the final bill of $1,500 was affordable. Before it could be erected, however, the statue needed to be regalvanized. This is because the statue wore several concerning articles of clothing. It wore a kepi hat, not a Confederate style slouch cap, and its belt buckle read U.S., the cost of substituting the hat was prohibitive, but Mitchell, a Northern capitalist who had already worked on union statues at Gettysburg, Chickamauga, and Yonkers, and was happy to make his money on both sides of the sectional divide, agreed to recast the buckle to read CSA. In the end, Jessamine's seven foot soldier clutching a rifle and bayonet with both hands and with a knapsack slung across his shoulder arrived by train with a trans-sectional identity. This kepi hat wearing soldier had transformed, but only partly from Union to Confederate. To the locals watching the statue installed in the southeast corner of the courthouse lawn in early June of 1896, this figure must have seemed absolutely bizarre. In fact, at the dedication several weeks later, a member of the Monument Committee confessed that the process had, quote, taxed the taste, the energy, and the wisdom of those in charge to their fullest extent. At the ceremony itself, though, this cognitive dissonance was not apparent. On Monday, June 15, 1896, 5,000 people, more than double the population of Nicholasville, gathered for the unveiling. They heard a brass band play Dixie, 
a Confederate quartet sang the, the stirring song, Oh, Lay Me Away with the Boys in Gray. And then a white veil descended to reveal a resolute soldier, his left foot forward, standing on a slab of limestone as he clutched a rifle and bayonet. Hundreds of veterans shrieked, rebel yells, and cheers escalated to a deafening roar for several minutes. It all seemed so inevitable, and it continued to seem so, even into the 1980s, when archaeologist Stephen McBride was digging up Camp Nelson, and neighbors approached to ask if he had uncovered any cool Confederate artifacts. But of course, it was Union memory that had been truly buried. Thanks, everybody, for listening, and I'll turn it back over to Jamie. Thank you, David. Uh, so, the, like I mentioned, the uh, Q&A section is open, so if anybody has any questions uh, that we might be able to address, go ahead and just type them on in there. Uh, and while we're waiting for that, if anybody has questions, uh, I just want to, I have a few questions of my own and a couple of, of comments. Um, the the statue itself, I mean, that that is just a perfect way to kind of conclude this. Mm -hmm. There seems, to, you know, that it just really is kind of spot on there. We're talking about Kentucky and the the kind of again cognitive dissonance as you mentioned but the these this idea of the construction of confederate memory in kentucky i'm wondering if, if you could speak a little more to that because it's it, kentucky never secedes so there is that construction process that is, is necessary right it does take time to, to finally arrive there yeah yeah i think uh, across the commonwealth two-thirds of those who served as soldiers in the Civil War were, were Union soldiers. Yeah, so the default would seem to be uh, Union memory over Confederate memory. Um, I think part of it has to do with, as I kind of described in my lecture, um, a, a kind of defecting of Union, Unionist folks over the issue of um, of race and Confederate veterans encouraging this kind of thing. Um, the statue association that put this up was actually a bipartisan uh, committee. It was mostly Confederates, but there are actually a couple of Union uh, veterans that joined it uh, as well, encouraging this construction of, un of uh, Confederate memory. But in Jessamine County, as I've kind of poured through the pages of the Jessamine Journal, you see it constructed uh, through lecture series. Um, a guy named E.O. Um, Grant, who was also a Confederate surgeon, was uh, he was he was a, a, a he gave these beautiful renditions of uh, Confederate victories in the Civil War and would just leave audiences completely transfixed uh, for an hour at a time in local churches and civic organizations. A lot of them wrote their uh, memoirs, uh, which were widely circulated and read. Uh, Confederate associations uh, were, were built, the UDC, and I, I counted at least two or three or four. And as time went on, they had like youth versions of them, which helps explain how it how, how Confederate memory could remain so dominant well into uh, the 20th century. Okay. I, oh, so we, we have a, a question here uh, from one of the attendees. Um, have you found many personal narratives from Black soldiers at Camp Nelson? And if so, where did you find them at? Hmm. Not a lot. And most of them came from the kind of National Monument site uh, themselves. Uh, I'm trying to think of their names. Uh, the The piece that kind of grabbed me the most was from a, a, a soldier named Joseph Miller. And um, he didn't really write his memoir. It, it, it actually comes to public view in a legal document. So Joseph Miller's uh, family, his wife, and I think he had four or five children had fled to Camp Nelson from their slave owner 
um, were allowed into the camp and then promptly ex expelled. Um, there's a story that's becoming more and more known as the National Monument uh, becomes um, uh, more visible. But um, after the expulsion, he he wrote up his testimony of what had happened to them, and it uh, it became national news, published in hundreds of, of newspapers across the country. Um, partly because of the problem of literacy, you've got a lot of folks, white folks, white missionaries, especially at Camp Nelson, who are um, kind of talking with them and do, basically doing oral interviews uh, with them. And so we have those, especially in the American Missionary Association archives. Uh, that's one place that I have found some of these uh, some of these narratives, but less than you would expect. Uh, let's see. Another question. Um, you had mentioned the white Jesmond County members of the GAR went to Lexington for GAR meetings. In what other ways did you see Jesmond County residents of all races in dialogue with and possibly in the orbit of other Kentucky cities? Hmm. What was the subject of that again? Who was in the orbit of other? Uh, in what other ways did you see Jesmond County residents of all races in dialogue with, or possibly in the orbit of other Kentucky cities? Yeah, in terms of Civil War memory, not a lot. Louisville be, would be the biggest one probably, and that's mostly because of uh, Bennett Young. So Jessamine County native, never really came back home after the war, settled in Louisville. He'd gotten a law degree from a, a university over in the UK, I think in Scotland and then uh, started practicing in Louisville. And um, he he was, he was became the commander in chief of, of one of these big Confederate associations. And so he brought, I think a hundred Confederate veterans from Louisville with him to the dedication of Jessamine County's Confederate statue. And so in the Jessamine Journal, you see uh, descriptions of Young and his work and then in the Louisville newspapers, the Courier Journal especially, um, you'll see accounts of Bennett Young having returned home. But on a broad scale, I simply didn't see a lot of it. Uh, let's see, we have time for a couple more questions here. Uh, we have one question about uh, the archives. I'm not sure if you can answer that or not. Uh, what became of the archives in the quartermaster or uh, the funeral home at Camp Nelson? of the funeral home at Camp Nelson. Hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure exactly what that's referring to. Yeah, I do know that the uh, archives for Camp Nelson as the supply depot um, are at the National Archives. Um, and I think you have to, I don't, I don't think you go to the one in downtown Washington, DC. I think it's the one out in the, the suburbs where have those big warehouses. And I've not actually been there myself, but the archaeologist that I referred to at the end, Stephen McBride, uh, has described to me what it was like to, to go there. And uh, using those archives, he was able to pinpoint the location of that refugee camp um, that, that these uh, formerly enslaved people were expelled from. And what a, a poignant moment that was for him. All right. Uh, one more question here. And I can answer, I can talk a little about this as well. So this is kind of a general question. Uh, how common were pro-slavery unionists in Kentucky? Mm. Go ahead and take a crack at it. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'm going to say that it's uh, pro-slavery unionists. Um, we're talking about uh, people who, who owned slaves, were enslavers, and were supportive of the union. Um, I'm going to go ahead and say that at least in the beginning of the conflict, they were probably in the majority, right? because we're talking about the reason why Kentuckians initially support the Union and don't support secession is because of they believe the institution of slavery will be better protected within the yes. United States than out of the United States. Now, the real question becomes, you know, how 
much do how how far does their loyalty go and that's really tested in 1863 the emancipation proclamation and especially the spring of 1864 when you have the open enlistment of enslaved yes. people at camp nelson that's when you start seeing these defections as it were and this this notion that kentucky waited until after the civil war to secede well i mean there's again there's some truth to that and it's because this it, this kind of upends what they originally thought they had been fighting for, right? Their conditional unionists, and the condition is that we will support the union as long as slavery is protected. And by 1864, that's clearly not the case. And I will also point out uh, for this person here who asked the question that there, we do have direct connections of this issue with Camp Nelson. Um, so if you go to Camp Nelson's website, they have really done some research on some of the USCT soldiers that have been recruited there and trained there. And there was one soldier, they actually have an image from him. His name is William Wright. Uh, and they actually have a quote by him too. Somebody at some point had interviewed him after the war. So he signs up at Camp Nelson with the 114th uh, USCT, uh, which was one of these regiments that saw action out in Petersburg and eventually was posted down on the border of Mexico and Texas after the war. But William Wright was actually owned by a white steamboat captain in Frankfurt by the name of John Russell, I believe his name was. And John Russell was a unionist from beginning to end. And actually, and this wasn't very common, gave William Wright, the person he owned, permission to go down to Camp Nelson and enlist. So in that case, you have somebody who's you know, it's pro-slavery, but at that point, it's clearly more pro-union than pro-slavery. So William Wright goes down to Camp Nelson and enlists in the 114th USCT, and he comes back after the war and goes back to work with John Russell, his former owner. So they must have had some kind of relationship. John, we know what happens afterwards is that John Russell dies in 1869. He's buried up in Frankfurt Cemetery. William Wright had worked with him up to that point. He is not buried. He's also from Frankfurt. He's not buried in the, anywhere in Kentucky. He's actually buried in Iowa. <laughs> um, and we tracked him down there and Camp Nelson did. And we have a quote from him saying that the reason why he went was because of all of the upsurge in white regulator violence against African-Americans, the post-war era. We have Wright being quoted saying that he had fought too hard and too long for his, you know, for his rights to have them taken away from him. So we, we do have that, that direct connection with, with, with Camp Nelson. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're exactly right about the change over time. The other uh, variable here, of course, is uh, region, like which part of Kentucky are we talking about? And in a place like Jessamine County, that at the beginning of the Civil War was 40% uh, Black, almost all of those would have been enslaved people. Um, there would have been a much stronger kind of pro-slavery unionist sentiment than say in a place like Eastern Kentucky, I think. Well, okay, it is, so it, it's 7.30. Uh, so I am going to go ahead and, and wrap this up. Uh, so this concludes tonight's uh, Kentucky Military History Museum speaker event. And I would like to thank our presenter, David Swartz for his time, uh, for illuminating this complicated period in military history and Civil War history. And I'd also like to thank our audience uh, for their interest in this topic. So we will see you all next time.